there are two Hawaiians of, um, that have changed my life, you and Bette Midler. Um, <laughs> and uh, any state that can produce the two of you is okay by me. Um, so I wanted to tell, tell us a little bit about those first years in Hawaii and Mahu. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that I pronounced it properly, um, <laughs> Mahu, and um, t tell, tell the folks what that means. Well, Mahu is a <clears throat> Native Hawaiian um, identity and term a label for people who live outside of the gender binary, largely um, folk um, who in our loosely I guess Western translation would be like trans women. And so for me, I remember in the seventh grade, my hula teacher was a mahuvahine. I love that you had hula lessons. God. <laughs> <laughs> I want to live there. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And so like the fact that, you know, the Department of Education in Hawaii hired a trans woman, like my yes. everyday life just was changed and shifted. You know, I didn't have to look to Law and Order or Ace Ventura, Pet Detective or Silence of the Lambs to see <laughs> trans people represented. They were a part of my everyday. I had hula lessons three times a week after school. And so Kumu Kauai was this person that was just, she took up space. Um, mm -hmm. And she, I hate to use that term, but she normalized, you know, gender nonconformity and being, being different in that sense. Um, and then I met my best friend, Wendy, who clocked me at the playground and was just like, bitch, what are you trying to do here? Like, <laughs> we can turn this buzz cut into a Halle Berry do if you want, you know, like let's, we can remix this. How old were you? I was 12. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just got so lucky that within the first few months of being there, I found this best friend who had this like, you know, this hallway of femininity in her home. She had like, you know, porno magazines and she had wigs and she had eyeliner and she had clothes. And it was just like this really great space of desire and pleasure yes. that yes. I got to share with like a sister. I always saw her as a queen. She very much saw herself as a goddess. Mm -hmm. That's her, <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna respect her identity. Yeah. Um, oh. But she was just- How old is, she, how old is Wendy? She's a year older than me, but okay. we were in the same grade. Okay. Because, you know, she's a little, slow um, <laughs> in terms of books yeah, yeah. Um, uh, read, read, she could read, read but read, she couldn't read, read. Yeah. Right. Um, but she, <laughs> she was very much she was so big yes. I could just hide behind her so if I started yes. tweezing my eyebrows no one really noticed or yes. I started you know wearing eyeliner no one really noticed you know because Wendy was always doing more she was always yes. five steps ahead of me yes. um, and just so much more brazen and so that was contagious to have a friend who didn't care so much about what people thought and I'm not the only girl that she did this to like she literally was the passage like the Underground Railroad was like yes. Wendy's house of transitioning. I was about like, to say the <laughs> Trans Underground Railroad. Yeah. That is the best TV movie, Trans Underground Railroad. I'm, I've been living for this. That is the greatest thing ever. That's, how, that's what it was. It was just a space of play. Sections of your book, the first book certainly, is getting the money to pay for the mm. transition. Mm. Yeah, for us, you know, there was this block called Merchant Street, mm -hmm. um, which was in downtown Honolulu. It's where the girls worked. At first, I came in very much with like my National Junior Honor Society hat on, which was like, <laughs> I could never do what they do. And so I remember this regular pulled up and saw me, and he was like, I want her. And so I knew that by doing this $60 hand job, that I would be able to have two months of hormones. Mm -hmm. I remember making that decision to get in that car and at you know 15 years old. It was easier for me if I tackled it as a journalist or as someone that was looking at yes. my life and then treating myself as a subject and then maybe later turning it to I statements. Yes, tell us about <clears throat> um, Bangkok and then coming back. Mm. Um, so I had known a woman um, who had gone there for her bottom surgery, mm -hmm. and I knew that that's where I was gonna go. I saw her results, I was like, that looks good. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, I didn't know if she was lying, she said she could have orgasms, but I was like, okay, whatever, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll figure that out. And so yeah, I went there alone. Um, I How old were you, Jen? I was 18. Mm -hmm. For me, which was so deeply affirming, it was like things made sense to me in mm -hmm. terms of looking at my own form and because I had to live in this body and exist in this body, I wanted to learn to love my body and accept it. And you started to do something was it um, with the support of this therapist, this idea of writing about yourself? Yeah, he just told me, he was like, you should keep going with that. Um, mm -hmm. Because I would sit in here and I had all these pathologies in my head that I had learned from the world that I grew up in that I was not deserving and worthy, right? Mm -hmm. Of love and affection and all this stuff. And so 
he believed that there was a part of me that like wanted to express so much of this stuff but had never really expressed it. And he was like, you have quite the story. You should probably sit down and think about like really just spending time in the morning before you go to your job at People Magazine and go and you know, sit and just write for yourself for one hour. Extraordinary moment happens when you're writing you know, this hour every morning. Um, you start to find yourself, and before you know it, there's a book. There's um, a significant uh, person mm -hmm. comes across your mm -hmm. book, and it's a man named Ryan Murphy, and he has um, a lot of interest in, in queer communities mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. um, how did Ryan get your book? I think he was looking to add a trans woman of color into the writer's room. Mm -hmm. I didn't think he knew what. In what, what show? For Pose, for Pose, for Pose, which is a series that um, premiered on FX in June. Mm -hmm. um, okay. um, it made history for um, you know assembling the most um, you know trans actors as series regulars. Yes. There's five um, trans women of color who are the centers of the show, in addition to the magnificent Billy Porter. For me, it was just about, you know, that we could be the protagonists. I mm -hmm. think in so much of the work that I've tried to do is to recenter us and no longer put us as these great martyrs that come in for an episode or as a subplot to the straight character, straight cisgender characters' life to teach them about, you know, they die and then it teaches them about authenticity, like, oh, yes. I can be my real self too, yes. you know? Um, and so instead, we wanted to reframe <laughs> that and say that what are our lives? Um, you know, our only struggles are not just with our bodies and what we do with our bodies, but also how we share our bodies and what are our dreams and what are the, you know, obstacles that it takes to get there and how do we get in one another's way as well? Because when we say family, it's complicated.